Well, unlike Adam, I am not happy to be wearing a suit for the second day in a row. I'm not sure why Adam is happy to do that, but good for you, Adam. Uh, where are you? Oh, there you are. Uh, you know, in, in 2020, you know, the, the word of the year was probably unmute, right? We use that word over and over and over again whenever we're on Zoom calls. Well, in, in 2021, I've seen the word resilience more in the past month or two than I've seen in my entire life. Uh, and so it is clearly what business is focused on, it's what government is focused on, it's what all our stakeholders are focused on. So no better way to kick off the second day of the uh, you know, AmCham in-person uh, portion of the Asia Pacific Summit than to talk about resilience across uh, different sectors. If you go through those point of view papers, uh, which you can get off of that, uh, uh, you know, off of, off of Blue Up, um, you will see that there are consistent themes that run across all of the different sectors, uh, both the functional sectors and, and the business sectors, when it comes to resilience. Um, one of the things is, is about harmonizing standards. One of the things is about the portability of, of data and its interoperability. Um, another issue uh, is data privacy. And I think as the Deputy Prime Minister said yesterday, uh, we have to be thinking about resilience, we have to be thinking about how we apply all of these things, but to do so in a way that doesn't advance um, income inequality, that doesn't advance um, the growing digital divide that we see. So that is a real challenge uh, for all of us uh, to do. And we have three great speakers to talk about uh, their perspective on resilience, how they're living it in the pandemic era, and how they're preparing to deal with it in the post-pandemic era. So I'll ask each speaker, just as I call on them, to introduce themselves, their companies, and then talk about resilience and what it means in terms of their operations today. So approval, why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone. My name is Apoof. Uh, I've spent 22 years in the FMCG sector, working in procurement uh, for Procter & Gamble, you may be aware, and Kimberly Clark. Uh, resilience for the FMCG sector really uh, focuses on three vectors. The first one is making sure that inbound supply chain is resilient, which means taking care of your suppliers, their financial health. Uh, we've had a lot of suppliers who are very small companies, SMEs, etc., who had a lot of problems in arranging uh, you know, cash flows, etc., during the COVID-19. So making sure that they stay afloat and hence they can continue to support our businesses. Second part is making sure there is good supply assurance, materials and services are able to reach our companies. Uh, there have been a lot of challenges on logistics, uh, shutdowns, etc., which we have to overcome. And making sure we are seamlessly connected uh, between our partner companies and ourselves uh, to enable the resilience to really operate with operation discipline. The second vector of resilience has been internally in, within the companies which is driving collaboration tools as a work became more virtual, making sure our employees and sites uh, stay safe and they are able to operate uh, and produce the products which we can supply to the markets. Uh, and then making sure that we create a culture of innovation and learning to deal with uh, the new requirements of resilience. But most importantly, what, is, uh, what has been a new frontier for FMCG industry is how to engage with our consumers and our customers. Uh, there's been a, a requirement for a new set of products and services, uh, which has been kind of accelerated by the pandemic. So how do we engage and accelerate our engagement with our consumers on a digital platform? So, you know, with virtual stores, because people couldn't come to shops anymore. They couldn't come to uh, physically access the products anymore. Uh, that generated a lot of data for our consumers, how to manage that data properly, how to leverage that data to give the customers the product which they wanted, which was customized for them, purposeful for them, then had to be delivered anywhere at any time and pretty much under any kind of circumstances, which led to a completely new set of challenges on resilience, uh, especially around logistics and planning and how do we make sure that the products are in the right place at the right time as governments imposed uh, you know, trade restrictions and border closures, etc. Uh, what was very, very interesting uh, for 
a lot of FMCG companies which were into essential goods was how to get affordable products and services to the people because a lot of segment of societies who lost their jobs and were economically suffering could not afford very expensive products but it was a social responsibility for the FMCG companies to make sure that the products are accessible especially the essential products like face masks, hand sanitizers, uh, you know, essential goods that they are accessible to every startup society uh, and they are accessible in a very affordable and a usable format. So these are some key elements of res resilience which came to the front. And, and I want to come back to you after we, we, we go through the panel, but I think one of the things that to, to, to talk about next for you will be the challenges in doing so because you, you talk about, as a logistics company, but you're talking about you know, a lot of issues around data, you talk about uh, how do you address uh, income inequality and prevent it from getting worse, which isn't anything that most logistics companies were thinking uh, pre-pandemic or were just beginning to think that. So that's a good challenge to come to next, but while we still talk about the meaning of resilience, I mean, Maureen, maybe you could talk about it from the healthcare perspective. Of course. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. So I'm from Sanofi. We're a global biopharmaceutical uh, whose purpose is to support patients through their health journey, whether it's about preventing illnesses with vaccines or treating with, uh, you know, treating chronic diseases and rare diseases. And uh, the general manager for the pharma business in Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore, and the one Sanofi country lead for for Thailand, Malaysia. But also, I have the honor to be uh, co-chair of the healthcare committee. So resilience um, for me and, and for us has been really about empowering people because resilience starts from within and it starts from within the organization as well. So our focus has been very, very quickly as the pandemic started uh, about how we can uh, make sure we keep our people very clear on the end game and the, 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 you know, keep, you know, focus on our actual goal, which is about serving patients but we would empower them and give them room to adjust to the situation and how we do that. Uh, so we, we did a lot of things immediately around uh, you know, flexibility, mental health. We were the first company globally actually to declare a global work from home policy from the 16th of March, so you know, exactly a year ago. Uh, and we put a lot of effort to uh, you know, focusing first on the employee well-being and safety but also on, on you know, giving them that space to organize themselves to still focus on their end goal, but find another way. And one of our focus, and my focus as a, as a leader, has been to say, don't postpone, delay, stop. Try to do differently, but keep to your action plan, just change it. And I think that has led to a, a, a real uh, you know, transformation and resilience of people uh, throughout the, the, the pandemic, and it was really re well received, and, and, and we got a lot of actually recognition of how we handle that, uh, that pandemic from our employees and, and, and through a, a, few, a few awards. Now, once we've done that, then once we reassured them, it really gave them that same, uh, you know, we, we really took that approach to say we need to continue to empower patients and consumers, as we also have uh, some, some consumer healthcare activity. Uh, and, uh, and here, uh, we've had to adjust like everybody else, and I think there are two key themes. Uh, it's been a lot of it virtual and digital. So starting again from what the end goal is, how do we serve the patients, how do we serve our customers who are supporting the patients, like healthcare professionals. Uh, on the one hand, we had a real-world acceleration of our uh, multi-channel transformation that was in place, but still, you know, going sort of, you know, as it could. And it was a, a major shift. But with that constant thing that um, it's not about just connecting because we can't do it otherwise through virtual. It's really about bringing value, content, and keeping to our end goal again because we're here for the long term. And it's not about you know coping with a transition phase. It's about building our future way of, of working. And the other area, which is probably more relevant for today's conversation, is uh, is um, is that we've looked to address this uh, huge gap that started very quickly to show uh, on the unmet uh, well. You know, and the needs of the patients uh, when healthcare resources started to repurpose uh, to COVID-19 and uh, safety distancing, restrictions, lockdown prevented uh, patients from going to the hospitals, their doctor, to the pharmacies. Uh, so we've really here again built on something that we knew was really important and was the direction of travel and transformation, but tried to accelerate how we 
engage with uh, healthcare professionals, uh, authorities, um, public and private uh, healthcare provider organization to see how we can develop a more virtual solutions, integrated care uh, types of approach. And it's obviously still in progress, uh, but really trying to, um, to help support this uh, digital health and telemedicine movement that was starting to create. So we created a few partnerships, uh, things like you know, launching a virtual platform for um, diabetes patients in Malaysia, which had a lot of traction and works really well for educating patients on their treatment management, uh, but also on how to take their insulin when they don't want to come out of their home and, 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 uh, and go to the doctor. And those, those changes are, are here to stay. So it's been a big part of our resilience and in terms of how we actually um, you know, leaped on it to accelerate that transformation with always in mind our end goal, which is how to be better serve the patient. And what, well, I'm going to come back to you when we talk about the challenges of becoming resilient. But when you, when, when you hear telemedicine, you can hear, well, that's great because you're now going to be empowering patients who might not have gotten you know, access to health care. But at the same time, you may be increasing that digital dividing, increasing the inequity where those that have the access to the technology are going to be able to not only get health care, but maybe better health care, and those that don't have it are going to fall further behind. And then that's going to increase the inequality, which is then going to uh, you know, lead to, to you know, increased protectionism and more nationalism, which is going to stop from what you wanted to accomplish. So we'll talk about that as how do we prevent that challenge from occurring. But John, and maybe tell a little bit about what Informatica does as well. And, and you know what role data plays cutting across all sectors and maybe with a focus on healthcare. Sure. Thanks, Steve. It's a tall order, but I'll try. So i um, very pleased to be here. Thank you, everyone, uh, from Informatica. So Informatica is a pure play uh, data management company. Uh, so 20 years in the business. So you know, whilst we're busy um, helping uh, basically the majority of Fortune 500 companies with you know focus on healthcare providers, life science companies, even regulators. Uh, about, uh, yesterday's discussions as well. So how we to be involved into that, uh, that conversation. So in, in, you know, both as in you know, the industry and also as, a, as Amcham, we, we want to call out for this uh, you know, um, uh, collaboration across the different stakeholders uh, to define guidelines, to define a framework, uh, but to do it together. Because collaboration is really what's going to make this work. And so, John, I mean, governments have, have legitimate concerns and, and regulatory needs, especially on data privacy, right, and data security. So one, government needs to make sure that the patient's data, you know, if it's, if it's medicine, but that, that, that whatever data a, a business has, that the customer's data is protected. And, and so the, the customer has the right to privacy. And then the government also can regulate the business to ensure that they're ensuring that that data doesn't get stolen, right? And then so that you have to have all the cybersecurity regulations in place. Where are governments and businesses intersecting now on, on those two very legitimate needs for government? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So, you know, a couple of notes about, I guess, the regulatory environment and, you know, with the lens of telehealth to begin with and then uh, followed by perhaps the organizational response, right? Um, so if I, if I think about telehealth and uh, perhaps just focusing on Singapore as a kind of prototype for that, uh, we've seen, I think since 2015, you know, formal guidelines from the ministry regarding, you know, how telehealth could be done. So guidelines are a good start. And then, you know, uh, for the, the point of view paper, you know, the regulatory sandbox is something that uh, not just Singapore, but many governments are considering. John, explain what a sandbox is. Explain what a regulatory sandbox is. Okay, disclaimer, I'm not a legal person, still an IT guy. Uh, but nonetheless, this is where, you know, as we all know, healthcare services are heavily regulated, right, um, for, for patient safety reasons but fully recognizing that business models and care delivery models are evolving rapidly. This gives, you know, not just startups, but even large organizations some space. I think entrepreneurship is the word I'm supposed to put in here. Uh, some space for uh, large organizations to think out of the box and really go ahead and pilot new efforts, right? And I would say, you know, again, just as a archetype, uh, not my opinion, but probably uh, the government would have considered that to be somewhat successful. I just checked last night, uh, the Singapore's regulatory sandbox for healthcare, uh, telehealth in particular, uh, was closed in February 2021. Right? And that will be followed now with essentially uh, putting that into law. Right? So we have the Healthcare Services Act, uh, which again is quite a modular framework, very nicely done, such that they can then turn that into you know, a bit more prescriptive, a bit more defined. And I guess, you know, last word on uh, 
this side, this half of the policy space, is essentially even as we, and by we I mean I used to work for a healthcare provider for 10 years, uh, are feeling a way forward as to how best to do this. Right? They benefit, we also benefit from regulators at some point becoming quite clear as to where the rules of the road are, right? And you know, before we even bring in the cross-border considerations. Now, to deliver that sort of model of care for telehealth, I think the other major one is, of course, the privacy aspect, right? And, and across the board, you know, every country in this region has got some flavor of that. And I'm quite glad to say that, you know, contrast a couple of years back where a lot of us working in sort of cross-border or multinational uh, concerned about data localization requirements, like I'm trying to keep everything on shore, we've sort of seen a shift. And if I could just be very broad, you know, you're basically looking at regimes where you're either able to demonstrate equivalence, right, GDPR equivalence, or ability to manage patient consent gives you that coverage to then not just deliver telehealth, but then use the data even across the border in a place where the patient understands the data is going to second country, right, with whatever standard of data protection that is there. So that gives us some coverage, but it's still a patchwork, is what I would say. Especially as the future could be your patient and your doctor and your data processor and where the data resides for all in different countries in different parts of the world. Indeed, you know, and um, am I still allowed to speak a little bit about the organizational lens? So I really loved the patient experience, the customer experience perspective on that. Because, you know, telehealth is kind of like a technological statement, in fact, it's a whole umbrella of stuff. But really, again, putting myself in a patient's shoes, right, it's just one modality of treatment. And this has been a bugbear for oh, decades, right? Uh, the hospital, parts of the physical healthcare institution can't figure out who I am, or rather duplicate records of me, right, sometimes with error. And if we add in additional modalities, like telehealth, it's incumbent on us delivering that to really build a holistic picture of the patient. Right? It's all about that experience. Telehealth is one part of that experience. We've got appointment systems, we've got the electronic medical report uh, records, sorry, supporting that experience. There might be some non-video modalities of telehealth as well. So how do we kind of bring that all together, right? And, and again, you know, plug for data management, but the foundation, right? Bringing that view together, maybe cleaning up the data estate that we have. And I've asked my colleagues in supply chain, it's the same story, isn't it? Right? Where's the master data? Where's the reliable view of the individuals? Right? Such that we don't send conflicting messages, which first of all is a bad experience, but I think when we bring in health, it's a patient safety concern always. Right? So, so I bring us back to the fundamentals, and of course, you know, terms like master data management come in, but uh, you know, that's a conversation for another day. Thank you. So as, as we bring this panel to a close, I, mean, I think the thing that kind of strikes out at me is that what we've really seen, you know, from an AmCham perspective is that, you know, we're really run by our committees, right? The committees drive the agenda. The healthcare committee drives the healthcare agenda and the, you know, the travel and tourism committee drives, drives its agenda. But, you know, as the pandemic has, has accelerated and changed businesses and has made, you know, all businesses, you know, in a way, data and technology companies, I mean, I think we have to think as, as AmCham, how are we going to mirror that? How are we going to adapt um, to what the you know companies are going through and need and how we can best support one another and then you know if you go through the uh, those point of view papers you know there's one recommendation that the United States should uh, come back to trade in Asia but let's start with the digital trade agreement right TPP is the gold standard but that is going to take some time but while we work and advocate for that we should also be advocating for the US to be part of digital trade agreements and for Singapore to expand on its existing digital trade agreements to start with the U.S. and to go um, beyond its existing two that it has today. And so all, you know, supply chain, healthcare, you know, uh, legal and IPR, they all have elements of data. So I think what we will try and do is figure out how do we synthesize all of this together and then figure out what it is that we can do so that our businesses can continue to learn from one another, our businesses can go to government and let them know where we are and how we're going, but also how governments can support us in the regulatory framework. So with that, approved Marine John, thank you very much, and thank you, Amcham, for having us.